for Brave One today for a love that goes beyond measure. Let's give it a shout of praise in this place. There's power that can break up every day. There's power that can empty out a grave. It's the power that's here with us today. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power. today, we, we walk into this room believing that there is power in the victorious name that overcame death, sin, and the grave. And because we believe in the power of your name, because we believe that you are present with us, alive, active, and moving, we believe that there is no thing that could stand up against the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Lord, today, our, our one pursuit, the one thing we desire is to step into your presence and open our hearts and say, here I am. Lord, would you search my heart? Would you know me? And would you do a transformative work in me? Lord, today, make your way to every heart. Speak the words that every heart needs to hear and do it only you can. As we sing this today, God, would you make our one desire just to come face to face with you? Father, I'm after your heart. Father, I'm seeking. several months ago that, that we introduced a prayer to this church that, that, that through years of asking God where are we heading 
he began to reveal holes in the heart of our community, of this area. And, and in that moment, there, there was a prayer that came out of that that said, Lord, may the deepest desires of my heart be to draw close to you. Because we don't believe in this place in, in striving towards or earning any sort of peace, any sort of security or rest. We know that that only comes when we draw near to the heart of the Father that welcomes us just as we are. We believe that Jesus' call to abide and connect ourselves to the Father is what brings life, is what infuses freedom into the souls of his people. And so today in this place, this song is a commitment of what we desire to be seen in this place. And it is a, the sole pursuit of the heart of Jesus. Jesus we love your heart, we love the things of your heart, we believe that you ultimately have your way in this place, that you're greater than anything that we could ever see, we know that we can earn nothing on our own, but it's only given as a gracious gift from you, because you welcome us just as we are today, so we're after you, we come after you. us to come into full view of a love that welcomes us, that doesn't require anything of us, that goes deeper than we could ever imagine. Oh, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son.
today because we know it's true. the love that you're extending to us today that you offer without needing anything from us in this moment except to say here I am Lord and so that's exactly what we want to do in this moment is open our hearts up to the transformative work that you want to do within us God we don't believe any amount of information or any amount of um, great experiences or great services is going to um, convince us that you're good enough but instead it's just you uh, extending a hand of grace towards us saying hey it's okay that you're broken it's okay that you need mending that's what I'm here for and so we come to you knowing that you bring wholeness, knowing that you are the one who lifts our hearts up and breathes freedom into our souls. We're grateful that you love us. We're grateful that it has no prerequisites or requirements, Lord. Um, and we just come to you today saying, do what only you can do. Amen. Amen. Church, are you grateful for all the work our God's already done? Amen. Why don't you go ahead and take a seat as we open our hearts to what God has for us today. Well, we're going to continue in this time of worship with a time of giving this morning. And, and giving has everything to do with just responding to what Jesus has been doing in our lives, in our community, in our church, and the people around us, and causing us to want to be generous with all the amazing gifts that he's given us. And so today we're going to do just that. So if you desire, you want to be a part of being generous and giving this morning, there's a couple ways for you to do just that. One is that the ushers, they can come forward now. They'll pass the buckets in just a moment. You can give that way. Or you can give electronically by following the instructions on the screen behind me. But whatever way that you decide to, to give this morning, let's just do it with a heart of generosity, heart of excitement, and a heart that, to know that Jesus is going to do some great things with it. Before we go any further, let's go to pray. Well, Jesus, thanks so much for allowing us to be a participant in what you're doing in this world and in this church. Thanks, Jesus, for all the things that you've graciously given us. And I pray that with these gifts that we give back to you, would you continually do amazing things with it so that we can, again, respond with joy and excitement and keep this, this cycle. So, Lord, we love you. We give this to you. We say this in your name. Everyone said amen. Ushers, you can go and pass the buckets. Well, good morning, guys. My name is Stephen. I'm the youth pastor here. And I am so excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, if you're a guest with us, Welcome. Uh, I just want to give you a special shout out to you. Thanks for being here. Welcome to all things Alpine. And, and we're so excited that you're here that we want to give you a gift. 
The way that you can receive this gift is by taking out your phones, texting the letters ACLZ to 97000. Again, that's ACLZ to 97000. You receive a text back, and then after service, you can walk out these doors to the Welcome Center, show them the text, and they'll be able to give you your gift. It's just our way to say hey and to get to know you just a little bit more. Well, just for those of you that, that didn't know, last weekend we took our youth ministry on a weekend retreat on the winter retreat. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it, was, it was pretty amazing. It's, it's a great time for us as our ministry to just be hyper-focused on Jesus, to know that he is our hope, and to keep pouring after one another in a community because we are designed to be in community. And so we had these amazing moments with our students and praying and caring for one another. It was awesome. But I also wanted you to, to know this, that this happens on a Wednesday night. This happens on a regular basis with, with our students. And so I do want to say this. If you are a parent in this room, if you're a leader in this room, we just want to say thank you so much for, for participating with us and, and, and allowing us to take care of your student, to pour into them and to be with them every weekend. It's a huge, huge blessing as we desire to help students take steps closer to owning their faith. So thank you so much for supporting everything we do. But again, on a Wednesday, we are able to do this every week. And we thought it would be fun to show you guys just what it looks like, a little glimpse on what a Wednesday looks like for us. And so we have a video for that. And then afterwards, we have an, another little clip announcement from uh, our uh, Natalie Mudd, who's going to share some things too. So let's take a look at the screen. jumped into serving in the youth like three years ago, um, probably because adults don't really understand me, but kids do. Uh, I'm a kid at heart, so um, when I got here, it was just like, you could just feel like Jesus is with these kids. These kids are really just looking for someone that's a role model to them, and you know, I don't think I'm anywhere near a role model, but um, you know, just to be able to listen and to talk to them about Jesus and to have that experience of just having fun together. Being able to provide that to an awesome ministry like this has just been awesome. You know, we come with an agenda, right? We gotta teach these guys something or we need to show them the way, you know, whether they know Jesus or not, or here's how I'm gonna go about doing this. And a lot of times, similar to service, in my experience, just coming alongside of them and just hanging out, having some fun, right? If you don't know me, why on earth would you wanna talk to or engage with me or talk about what's deep, deep down inside of you, especially if it's tough to talk about? I don't even know you. And so then how do I get to know you? Well, by coming down to my level and doing things I'm interested in. Use the word blessed a lot around the church, right? But truly, it's been a, it's been wonderful, and I'm, I'm looking forward for the next few years here. Be able to just you know talk to someone who is older than them and can relate to them. Um, I think it really makes a difference in their lives. Every week we have hundreds of students coming through our doors, and every week we have awesome leaders who passionately come to connect with these students. In fact, our goal here is simple. We want to help students make memories and connect to Jesus. In today's culture, it's not easy to be a student. The expectations are higher than ever before, and the pressures of social media can be overwhelming. But we help students face these challenges by providing a safe place that makes them feel welcome. A place where they can discover their faith with people their own age and other leaders that desperately want to see them succeed. And at the end of the day, after all the conversations, the games, our times of worship and teaching, our small group times, we get a glimpse of what it looks like for a student to encounter Jesus. And this is possible because of you. So from all of us leaders at Youth, we want to say thank you. Thank you for believing in us and wanting to come alongside us the way that you have. Because you give 
students encounter Jesus. Hey ladies, we want to invite you to our one conference coming up right here next month, March 6th and 7th. We have so many exciting things planned, including some of our favorite guest speakers who will inspire you to live a life fully alive. Grab some girlfriends and join us next month at one conference. We hope to see you there. Yeah, you can clap. Good morning. How many ladies are planning on going to one conference? It's good. Didn't hear any guy voices in there, so we're good. Uh, man, really want to encourage you. Uh, probably one of the best things. When you hear conference, sometimes I think it can get confusing. If you just want some time in growing close to Jesus, it's, an, it's a great opportunity. So we, we like to jump at those. Um, man. It's cold out. I'm tired of it already. Anybody else? Whew. Okay, so let's pray together that that goes away. <laughs> hey, earlier as we were singing, um, maybe just provide some insight. When my kids were little, one of my favorite moments, and so parents in the room, you'll, you'll remember this moment really clearly. It's when they're, when they're babies, they're infants, and they, they haven't connected with your eyes yet. Like, you haven't had that moment where you don't know if they see you or not, but then there's this moment where you're looking at them, and you're trying to catch their, and all of a sudden, they see you, and this little smile grows on their face. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody just got real warm, right? That was like, ah, right? Listen, that's what, when we take time in these moments to sing, and that's what that is. God, all day long, is up there going, wondering if he's going to connect eyes with us. And in that moment, when we sing and we honor him with that moment to say, this moment is about you, not us, and we connect eyes, it's like, oh, that's what this is about. So that's why we do what we do, and I just thought it might be helpful for us to understand that. Um, when you came in this morning, they were handing out sunglasses. I noticed some of you have those. Well done. You're wearing those. Um, I also know that when you put mirrors on a stage, um, love props, love visuals, they don't all, they're not all helpful. Um, when they're shining lights in your eyes. So um, we thought it would be fun to hand out sunglasses if you need them. And first service, as a matter of fact, I have two right here. Is there anybody right now, you've got the sun in your, uh, the light in your, boom, right there, you guys got them. There you go, no longer. Now my ADHD is going to kick in, and I'm going to be looking at you guys with sunglasses on, and it's going to be really weird, but that's totally fine. Hey, we are glad you're with us if you're visiting. My name is Dave, I'm the lead pastor here, and we're in a series called Living Values. And been looking forward to this series for quite a while, over a year, because as we understand these values and begin to see them become living values in our lives, not something we just talk about, but something that is actually happening in our lives, I believe God is going to use us in a way he's always longed to, to see the world transform for his honor and his glory. So we're in these living values asking this question, what would happen if the things we say we value as the church, which ultimately is what God values... The things we say we value as the church, we would also value as families that would impact our family as much as it impacts us as people. Because the church is the people. And the family is one of the greatest representations of the church. It's the way God set it up and designed it when it works the way God intended it to work. And not just adopt these values as the church and families, but individuals in such a way that it impacts how we treat our neighbors. It impacts how we do our job. It impacts everything about our life, everywhere we go. We are living these values. And so we actually believe that more than understanding these things that we say, hey, here's what we value as a church because God values these things, we also believe that this whole 
um, experience over these eight weeks that we're walking through this is more about how you grow than anything else. That we don't actually go grow from just hearing a good message on a Sunday. If your Christian walk is a Sunday, then you're missing everything. It's got to be more than that. It cannot be one day over every day. It has to be every day over one day. It's not that this moment isn't important, but hearing a good message isn't how we grow. That's comforting. How we grow is by the power of the Holy Spirit who is in our lives because we know Jesus, working and moving and speaking, and we allow him that control in our lives to lead us. That's how we grow. We grow by diving into the word of God and knowing what it says. And understanding the promises of God, the character of God, he is who he says he is. And hear the story of redemption, that God is reconciling mankind, that God is making all things right. And someday, the already but not yet, the kingdom of God will be declared over all. And that we also grow in community with each other, and there isn't any community like the community of God, because it's the only community that champions your growth in Jesus when it's done right. And so we're diving in the first week, six weeks ago, we talked about this truth that Jesus is our hope. Here's why we have mirrors. Let me help you understand the mirrors. Because we do not want you to hear these things, these values. Jesus is my hope. People are my passion. Worship is my, and say, I have to go do that. We don't actually believe it's about doing that when you get focused on the doing, you get focused on religion, our attempt, our attempt to earn God instead of God freely giving us what he gave us in Jesus. So we see the mirror because when we look in the mirror, we don't want to just be focused on our physical reflection, but we want to see coming back at us because we are in a relationship with Jesus that is real and matters. We want to see the truth that Jesus is our hope coming back. That when we look in the mirror, you say, hey, that guy or that girl, Jesus is their hope because I see it. That people are passion. So Jesus, our hope, we spent some time talking about the fact that there is absolutely nothing else in this world but Jesus that can hold your hope. Everything else is wishful thinking. The only one that can carry that weight is Jesus. And so our hope is in Jesus. Jesus is our hope. And the way we grow in our hope is remember the promises and character of God in our daily lives because he is who he says he is and does what he says he's going to do. That hope is a confident expectation of a better tomorrow based on the character and promises of God. The people are our passion. Why? Because people were God's passion. People are God's passion. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And every person your physical eye sees is deeply loved by God and ought to be loved by us. And so to the degree that you allow people in your life, no matter who they are, to come as they are, is the degree that people are your passion. Because you were allowed to come to Jesus as you were. And so we let people come to us as we are. Worship is our response. We understand that our desires and wants and loves are often ordered towards the world instead of the kingdom of God. And so we want our response to be worship, meaning that we take all of our loves and our wants and our desires and we put them in God and not in anything else because only God deserves our worship and our desire. So our response is obedience because he deserves it and loves us. We say community is our design. That quality Christian growth does happen best in biblical community. That we need each other. That you cannot exist in a silo on your own. That isolation is the enemy's plan because if he can get you isolated, he can create despair. And if he can create despair, he creates hopelessness. So we need community. And most community in the world today will not champion your growth in Jesus if it's not biblical community. I could say a lot about that. Last week, Alex talked on faith is our foundation. I have no idea what he said. I'm just kidding. I was here. He did an awesome job. He talked about faith being our foundation and what does it look like to live a life that lasts. And the way that we live a life that lasts is we put our faith in Jesus alone. And that it looks like trusting God. Today, we're talking about generosity is our norm. Woo! Right away, some of you went, oh, money talk. Perfect. Come to the church, I get a money talk. Just what I was expecting. Stop it. Come on. It's not about just money. Let me give you maybe the end before we go to the end. Let me give you the punchline before we get there. Okay? Here's what we're talking about. Generosity is a sign of a changed life. I'm going to put, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm saying that to the degree that you see generosity flowing out of your life in every way possible is the degree that God is showing up in your life or you're surrendering your life to him, to the Lordship of Christ. So it is a sign. 
It is not something I am working on and trying to do, but because I am in relationship with Jesus, it is coming out of me because his grace is flowing into me, which is the greatest generosity of all. And because of that grace, I am generous. It is a sign of life change. I'll also say it like this. Uh, the gospel doesn't just open our hearts. The gospel opens our hands. That's what the gospel does. It's not just I get a savior. It's I have a Lord. And because I have a Lord, I have a Savior, and that causes my hands to hold loosely to everything I've been given because everything is. And here's what I don't want you to do. Are you ready for this? This is what I don't want you to do. Um, and this can happen a lot in church. I don't want you, as we talk about the fact that to the, it makes strong statements, right? How many of you love strong statements? Hate them, some of us. We're like, don't like it. Strong statements can do something to us. Here's what it does to us. We make a statement like, to the degree that I'm generous and I'm not that generous is the degree that God, I am allowing God to be at work in my life and experiencing the love and the grace of God. We go, that's actually not true about me. And so what does that say about my relationship with God? And we start to feel guilt and shame and condemnation. Why? Because the devil's a devil. He's a one-trick pony. He lies. And so he's in your ear right now going, you're not a very generous person. Therefore, God doesn't love you. And that's not what we want you to experience at all. Here's what I experience in these moments when I realize that I'm not the generous person that God is to me. I am not to others. I sit in this moment and I get before God and I say, oh, man, I want that so bad. I don't see it the way I want to see it. I don't see it to the degree that you've impressed it upon my life. That generosity doesn't, but I want it to. And so I pray that you would let your grace flow into this space so that I can understand that. And so that I can go and be the generous. And I pray you would lead me into that. And I just lament that, ah, it's not what I would love for it to be. But God can help me. I'm not going to go try to work on being generous. I'm going to work on loving Jesus. And to the degree that I love Jesus is the degree that you are. you understanding what we're saying here? It, we don't feel the guilt and the shame and condemnation. That's not what God is about. That's the devil, the enemy of our soul. But we sit in this moment and we say, ah. God, I want to be more generous because you've been so generous. Now, let's unpack that, okay? Stand with me, if you will. In these moments, as we read the Word of God, we stand because it's probably one of the most important things that we will do all week long. In this moment, it is definitely one of the most important things that we will do. We're going to 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 5. But those who obey God's Word truly... Show how completely they love him. Those who obey God's word show how truly and completely they love him. That is how we know we're living in him. Those who say they live in God should live lives as Jesus did. I'm not going to take the should out of that. Should. I want you to go with me over. To Luke chapter 19. It's left in the Bible quite a ways. In chapter 19 of Luke, starting in verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. <laughs> he was the chief tax collector in the region, meaning he was not liked at all. He was crooked, he hurt people, he cheated people, he was about himself. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Ha, <laughs> ha, can you imagine? Jesus had to be sitting there going, I can't wait to get to Zacchaeus. He has no idea I know who he is. He has no idea I know he's in a tree. And I'm going to find him. And I'm going to I'm gonna go to his house. I'm gonna I bet Jesus was so excited, could not wait to get to Zacchaeus and say, Zacchaeus! Like he knew him. And what that did to Zacchaeus. Oh, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Why? Because he had been seen, church. And he had been loved. But the people were displeased. Oh, the people. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. Zacchaeus didn't care what the people were thinking and saying. He was with Jesus. He said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this house today. 
For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who were lost. The word of God. So, Father, in these moments, I pray that you would um, sharpen our listening, prepare our hearts, that we would be ready to hear the thing that you're wanting to say to us, and that that thing would sink deep, and it would come out of us in the way that you long to see it expressed in a world that is looking for Jesus. May that be our story today. In your name, amen. So generosity, uh, not about not talking today about money or tithing, though generosity is not less than that. Okay, and, and, and it's inferred. We'll definitely say that, um, that it's a huge piece of generosity because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if you want to trace your heart, trace your treasure. You'll find out what your heart's all about by finding out what you're spending your money on. All of that is true. But generosity goes way deeper, church, than finances. It's not less than finances and what God has given us, but it's way deeper. And so here's what I want to say. What if your generosity started with your values or with values, God's values. Let me, let me explain. Now, I'm going to abbreviate a little bit if that's okay because if we just sit here and watch me draw and write, it's just going to be long and boring, right? How many want long and boring? Not usually. So let me abbreviate. Is that okay? Get in your head what we're saying. So when it comes to the kingdom of God, we are saying as a church that God has, has impressed upon us as a leadership that these values need to come from our lives these are the things that we are about. These are our living values. Number one, Jesus is our hope. I said passion first service. Got it wrong, even though it was right there next to me. People are our passion. We believe that. We want that to be true. Worship is our response. In a world where we could have a lot of responses, and the, and the world does, our response will be worship. Uh, community is our design. Faith is our foundation. Today, generosity is our norm. Serving next week is our privilege. And scripture is our guide. What in the world? I mean, come on. If you looked in a mirror and 100% of your life represented those values, whoo, what kind of life ought that to be? A Jesus life, a kingdom life, a life of impact and influence, not for your sake or your glory because you don't want it anyway, but for his. Why? Because we worked out our identity. We're children of God. We don't need people's approvals or likes to know who we are. We're his. Ha! It's fun, right? Here's what's true. We, we more often live in the kingdom of me. Where instead of Jesus being our hope, other things, maybe it's one, maybe it's 15 things are our hope. And we don't necessarily want them to be because we know that our hope only rests in Jesus. But we live as if other things are our hope. How do we know? Because it gets our time, our treasure, our comfort, our talents, our resources. I mean, the list goes on, doesn't it? And, and on down the line. We have talked about, and we'll talk about even with this, with every one of these, that the world around us lets other things be their hope, other things be their passion, other things be their response, outside of what God would call us to. Why? Because it gives us this life to the full when we live in the values of God, not just as a church, but as families and individuals. And so listen to this. To the degree that other things besides God, when we're honest, are our hope, our passion, let's just say we're all incredible, and there's only one other thing that is offsetting what ought to be our value that is our value. I don't think that's true. I think we let a lot of things become idols in our lives over God. If we would stop doing these things, delete these things, unlearn these things, so that we can create space for these values to be true in our life, we would actually create the margin of time, the margin of treasure, the margin of talent that we would stop putting in the things that don't matter, and we would have a lot of space to be generous in the things that do. Thank you. You're thinking, aren't you? And it's the work of being honest with ourselves to say, you know what? Where I put my time and my talent and my treasures 
is showing me that I actually value a lot of things and the reason I have no margin and the reason I'm too busy and the reason I'm stressed out and the reason why I worry and the reason why I struggle to trust and the reason I have fear is because I haven't stopped so I can begin. Or I'm letting this cloud this. We've got to eliminate and walk away from the kingdom of me. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, that everything you've been waiting for has just happened. Repent and believe because the kingdom of God is here. Walk away from the kingdom of me. Stop valuing the things of the world. You want to know why you don't have margin? Because your values are off. But when you will unlearn and step into these values and let that happen because you know me and in relationship with me and I'm impacting and influencing your life like no one else, Man, you will have space and room to just be generous like crazy. All right. That was the beginning. When we say generosity is our norm, what do we mean by norm? And I want you to get this. What is a norm? Norm is defined as something that is considered normal. That was free. You came a long way for that, didn't you? Let me give you a little bit more. It refers to something that is usual, customary, or accepted, an accepted standard. So a standard pattern in our life. Saying please when you want something is an example of a cultural norm, right? When somebody says please to you, you're more apt to respond in kind. You're more apt to do what they're asking. You're thinking in your head, this is a sharp person. They had great parents. When somebody doesn't say please, in your mind you go, oh, say please, and maybe I will, right? You must have had bad parents. All these things are going through our head. It's a cultural norm. It's something that is standard. It's a standard pattern, if you will. And so all cultures have norms. The obvious use of norms is to answer questions like, what should I do or what should I be? And so we have these cultural norms. Matter of fact, we asked a bunch of people if the world was to fill in the blank of blank is our norm, what might they put in? Here were some of the answers we got. Divorce is our norm. Tension to manage, but there's some truth in that. Now, that's not shame and guilt on those who have been divorced. Stop it. God has probably taught you a lot. Self-absorption is our norm. Oh, we are so self-absorbed. How many of you know you're self-absorbed? Some self-aware folks. <laughs> oh, I wanted to go. I wanted to preach a whole other message right there. I'm going to stop. Tolerance is our norm. Money and material things is our norm. Perfectionism is our norm. Opinionated. People who are opinionated. The, the opin everybody has an opinion. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. <laughs> right? And everybody thinks their opinion is right. Entitlement is our norm. Electronics is our norm. <laughs> Some of you are just on the phone right now. <laughs> Taking notes, I'm sure. Business. Is our norm. Busyness is our norm. Hurry is our norm. Appearance is our norm. Being so caught up when we look in the mirror, not in the things that we want God to be shining back, but what we're not happy with or what we're focused on. Education. I mean, the list goes on. We could say a bunch of things, but listen, as followers of Jesus, we don't look to culture to answer that question, but we look to our faith in God's word to answer the question. What are our norms? And what we're saying here is that when the grace of God flows in, the norm is generosity. Why? Because we're grateful. We're grateful that he loves us as we are. We actually believe that culture should take its cue from the kingdom of God and his truth, not the other way around. Let me say it like this. The kingdom of God is coming down, not the other way around. It's on earth as it is in heaven, not in heaven as it is on earth. That would be dangerous for heaven. It's really important that we understand the kingdom response is different than the culture response. The kingdom of me response. And giving is the fundamental law in the kingdom. Giving. Because our kingdoms are certainly tied to our power and our will and what is ours. In the kingdom of me, that's the conversation that goes on right here, isn't it? In the earthly kingdom, they are all in competition with each other. And they are all clutching and grabbing, holding tightly so we don't lose anything. Even though we've been told that the tighter you hold to something, the faster you lose it. Proverbs. But in the heavenly kingdom, it's all about letting go. The whole earth is the Lord's, and the reason he made it was to give it. He said to Abraham, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. So this whole thing is all about 
giving is the law of the kingdom. The most famous verse in scripture is, for God so loved the world that he gave. It's, all, it's what he's been doing for eternity is giving. So when you say you want to be part of this process, heaven coming down, being a kingdom bearer, an imager of God, every time someone has stuff and they don't hoard it, every time someone gains possessions, they get generous with it, what's going on is up there is coming down here. That's what's happening. Generous living is the chance to live in the reality of God and his goodness and his love and eternal power, helping God bring what's up there down here. We get to be part of that. Mark 1, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is right here. So what is generosity? I just talked to you about norm. We're saying this, this is normal for us to just be generous. Is it normal for you to just be generous? Here's what generosity is. Generosity is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. And a lifestyle in which we share all that we have and all that we are all that we will ever become as a demonstration of God's love and a response to God's grace. Here's why. Because God's grace is the greatest generosity we will ever know. And we've been given it freely. Whew. Now this is going to get fun. A church can't just talk about generosity, nor can individual followers of Jesus simply commit to being generous. Why? Because for generosity to be a real and powerful witness of God's love, our actions must speak louder than our words. We don't get just to say we're generous. We either are generous or we are not. And we don't walk out of here saying, i got to be more generous. We need to walk out of here saying, I need to get closer to Jesus. Because that's where the generosity gets invested in our lives. Generosity flows from an understanding that all we have, all we are, and all we'll ever become is not ours to possess. And generosity results in practically sharing with others what we've been given for the advancement of the kingdom and the glory of God. This has never been about us, but we make it about us, right? Me too. Okay, I'm not just saying you, you, you. I'm in this with you. All right, I'll say this again. I say this all the time. If I limited what I'm living well as my options to speak on from the front of this room, it would be a really short list. I'm not up here preaching it because I'm always living it. I'm with you. I am working and trying on this, not in the stuff, but in the presence of God. And God is transforming and changing. I'm right with you. And I don't always see on the outside the things I want to see. And so I have to go back to God. You got to understand this. This isn't a, hey, you better do this or else. This is, we're in this together. It's really important that you understand that. Generosity results in sharing with others what we've been given for the advancement of the kingdom and the glory of God. That's what it's about. And we do that willingly because we don't need the credit. We don't need to be known because there's great fulfillment in knowing he is. And to the degree that I need to be known and I need to be is the degree I've missed this whole thing. And the importance of our identity in Christ. So generosity embraces a biblical understanding of stewardship. So here's where our ability to really live in generosity comes from. This understanding of biblical stewardship. Are you ready? Here it is. God is the owner of everything. He owns it all. Everything belongs to the Lord. The earth and the fullness thereof is his. It's not yours. Okay. Okay. Let that sink, because I think sometimes we say, oh, no. God is the owner of everything. What we have has been given to us by God. So he's the owner of it all, and because he loves us, he blesses us. Through the job that we've been blessed with, through the way in which we can manage the things that come to us that have been blessed, we are blessed to be a blessing. So God owns it all, and God loves us enough to bless us. But the things that we have, so everything we have, we have because God gave it to us. And the resources we possess are assets to be invested back into the kingdom of God. It's important that you eat. It's important that you have clothes to wear. And it is important that you have a roof over your head and maybe a car to drive. Though I've seen people make it without it. Listen, we, whether you realize it or not, and if you haven't put your feet in a third world country to sit next to those who don't have what we have, we are rich. We have been given a lot. 
And we have been given that lot to invest back into the kingdom through a generous heart. And here's what's really cool. It's giving till it hurts, but it's only giving till it hurts when you live in the kingdom of me. It's a whole heck of a lot of fun, though, when you're living in the kingdom of God to be generous. That's how you know a little bit of where you're living. No shame. To be generous, we have to understand what it means to be a steward, recognizing that what we have is not ours to own. We give back to God what he lavishly gives us. It also means we confess that Jesus is Lord over our treasure, over our time, over our talents, over our comfort, over our convenience, over our forgiveness. I mean, generosity spreads its tentacles far and wide, not just the three T's. You can't be generous without an appropriate discipline of biblical stewardship, which in turn demands generosity. If God's going to do this for me, I want to do it for others. Might be the reason he does it. The free gift of God's grace shapes our faith and leads to the conviction that all we have in the way of time, talent, treasure are things that we have been given for a purpose. And we cannot separate our acceptance of God's grace from the practice of generosity. You just can't. We don't have the privilege of saying, hey, God has done so much for me, and then keep it all. That is not why God gave. When you get grace, and you know grace, and you experience grace, God loving you right where you are and giving you childhood status as adoption in the family of God because you did nothing to earn it, you can't wait to give that back to others by every means possible. Generosity is the fullest expression of the life of a steward, one who has been given a gift and a gift that must be used wisely and for a purpose bringing glory to God. Uh, you see this in Luke 21 in the widow's might. You guys know the story? Just give you a real brief. They're sitting there in the temple, and Jesus is with his disciples, and they're watching people walk in and give, put money in the pot. And people are giving a lot of money, but they're not, they're giving of what they have, just their means. They're giving just enough, but they're not giving it all. But they're giving, but it's not a lot, but it seems like a lot. And Jesus knows she's coming. Like, I can't wait for her to get here. I can't wait to show these guys. Oh, that, that actually might be her. That, no, Jesus wouldn't say that might be. He knows. That's her. Because he's Jesus, right? And she's coming. He goes, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. This is going to be so good. This is going to be so awesome. And they're like, what's going on? He's like, I think my wife is trying to give me her last. Last one. She brings the two mites. All she has in the world. And she walks in and she drops it and she just goes, there it is. Probably not like that, but I mean, there it is. There it is. That's generosity. That's the kingdom of God. That's hope in Jesus and me. That's faith being a foundation. All the values right there. She's going, that was so awesome, buddy. She gave more than anybody else even though she gave less than anybody else. <laughs> it's generosity. I'm whispering, get on the line. <laughs> so what do we mean when we say generosity is our norm? When Zacchaeus met Jesus, everything changed. Not just his heart, but his hands. Church, I need you to hear this. Just a few verses earlier, we read about a rich young ruler whose wealth and possessions was a barrier to him following Jesus. Has your wealth and possession become a barrier to you and Jesus? Is it a barrier or is it a blessing? It was never meant to be a barrier. It was always meant to be a blessing so that you could be a blessing. And how we handle our time and our talent and our treasure and our comfort and our convenience and our, all of the things that we've been given has everything to do with how we orient our lives on Jesus who he is and what he says. The rich young ruler chose his wealth over Jesus, but for Zacchaeus, meeting Jesus loosened his hold on everything he owned and had and claimed at one point as his. All of it. Here it is. Generosity is our norm. Simply means that generosity is a sign of a changed life. I am not living here anymore. And to the degree that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide me and give me strength, to the degree that I claim his word of God over the sin and the temptation and the things, and the degree I surround myself with the community of God that champions my heart, I move to the kingdom of God and live in it fully because of what Jesus did on the cross. 
I break the hold of idols in my life and give God everything. Why? Because he gave everything to me. You can't claim to know Jesus and be stingy. Listen, some of us sit here and go, treasure, I do pretty good. And I'll be honest with you, this is a really giving church. There's a lot that we've been able to do all over the world because of the generous hearts. And I think God is blessing as a result of that. I think he's blessing our lives. Um, and it won't always look like treasure coming back. But the treasure will be deeper than you know. It's the law of reciprocity. You reap what you sow. You actually reap more than you sow. Then there's talent, which talent goes way past just the things you're good at to what the Holy Spirit gives you and the fruit of the Spirit. Man, what happens if you start being generous with patience when you're driving? When people aren't doing what you want them to do? What happens if you start being generous with love when people are unlovely? What happens if you start being generous with joy and peace and goodness? What happens? But you know the one we battle the most with? Time or talent, treasure? Yeah, time we are the most stingy with. I'll throw money at it all day long, but ask me to go do it? <sighs> and yet time, you want to know how to spell love? T-I-M-E. It's one of the greatest ways we can be Jesus is by giving our time. See, the gospel doesn't just open our heart, it opens our hands. The issue is giving sacrificially. Christians ought to give in such a way that there are things we forego in order to be generous. I need you to get this, because for me, this is the line. There are things we forego that we stop doing, that we give up, that we walk away from, that we delete in our life, that we do without. Not because it hurts, but because we love it when we get to. Might be a vacation so that we can go on a mission trip. Might be a car so that we can give someone else one. Whatever God would lead you, God wants to use the time, talent, treasure of your life for his kingdom so that people will know him. The issue is giving sacrificially. Christians ought to give in such a way that there are things we forego in order to be generous. And so that the changed life is a generous life. Not just our treasure and talents, but our time. We are the generous. And as followers of Jesus, it's not just important that we give, but how. God loves a cheerful giver. You know what that word means translated? A hilarious giver. <laughs> not Not... <laughs> Doesn't like that. Doesn't want you to do that. Hasn't asked you to do that. Cheerful giver. And giving gladly rests on the great why of Christian generosity. It's Jesus himself. Our Savior, our Lord, our amazing treasure that demonstrated the ultimate in generosity in coming to save us. Though he was rich, yet for the sake, our sake, he became poor. Your sake, he became poor. So that you by his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9. If Jesus is in us, then increasingly such an open-handed tendency will be in us as well. Generosity is one of the greatest evidence of truly being Christian. 1 John 2, 5 and 6. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Jesus couldn't be more generous than his example. Paul encourages us to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. And one important way we do that is by taking stock in whether our lives are beginning to take on the self-sacrificial and crucified nature of Jesus. We'll give of ourselves and our resources when that becomes true. Being rich in God isn't about what we have. It's about what we give away. So let me bring this back around for you. Zacchaeus. Like Zacchaeus, Jesus sees you. <laughs> he knows your name. And he loves you. Oh, does he love you. And he loves me. Zacchaeus was changed by love. And he gives up the thing that meant the most. Out of gratitude, he gave 50% to the poor. And law didn't require him to do so. And he gave back four times what he had taken to every person he had taken it from. <sighs> amazed by love. Hear me. Amazed by love. When I'm amazed by love, by the only love that is amazing, which is his love, 
when I'm amazed, my response will always be to give what I most treasure. Zacchaeus met Jesus, experienced his love, and gave what he treasured most. That trip to Goodwill, I call it the public dumpster of what we don't want. I don't even take the receipt I feel so bad when I drop off sometimes. And we sit here and go, I gave today. Did you? Did you give what you most treasured or what you didn't want? It was nice of you. Somebody's, one man's junk is another man's treasure. That's true. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about generosity. We're talking about giving the things we treasure most away. Why? Because we have the one that is most treasured. (laughs) Take the whole world, but give me Jesus. And if I lose it all, I'm okay because I have Jesus. So God, if you're calling me to give this, even though I love it, I will give it because you gave what you loved most in Jesus. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Would you stand with me? In these moments, I just invite you to know, to understand, to process the length at which God went to say these words, I love you. Man, do I love you. And that grace that came flooding in because he accepted you right where you were, and he does it every day with new mercies, that that love and grace would cause the generosity of God to flow out of your life by the things you most treasure, holding loosely to. Sing this. She loves us, oh how he loves us, oh how he loves us, oh how he Come on, sing like we believe that his love is greater than anything we've ever seen. he loved us. So generosity is our norm because grace is ours. And the grace is the generosity of God. And so 
we let that generosity flow because we understand grace. May you know the love of God today. May you know the grace of God. May you know what it means to abandon your life to the one who loves you more than anyone else will. Is your hope. And in doing so, may you experience the joy of seeing lives changed by the blessing of being a blessing. We love you. Thankful for you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.